Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining the ADA webinar today. Uh, the topic is the importance of investment in social capital and infrastructure, the necessity of all of us doing that, and in particular, the importance of resilient businesses in the context of broader community resilience. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Margaret Morton. I'm the Executive Director at the Institute for Disaster Resilience, and I'm delighted to be your host today. I would like to start by acknowledging that I'm hosting this event uh, in Melbourne on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all joining us today. Uh, and I acknowledge and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in the event online today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and I celebrate the diversity and richness of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land and the water across Australia. Please do what some of you are already doing, which is introduce yourself through the chat. Feel free to say hello and acknowledge the country on which you're standing. Before we begin, I do have some brief housekeeping notes. Today's event is being recorded and the recording will be made available after the event on the Ada Knowledge Hub. We will be using the Q&A feature on the Zoom to take questions. So please uh, locate the Q&A feature and post your questions at any time through the seminar in the Q&A box. Please don't use the chat. Please use the chat for what you're doing right now, which is all saying hello and making any other comments. Um, if you are sharing comments and thoughts and reflections uh, during the presentation, please uh, be aware that it's a public forum and please be respectful of one another and of our presenters when you post those questions and comments. Uh, but as we get questions popped into the Q&A, you are able to upvote those questions and we will uh, pay attention to that toward the end of the seminar when I have a look at the Q&A and we will ask um, as many of the most popular questions as we can, as I'm sure you've all come with questions today. So, as we've seen over recent years in this country, natural hazards such as flood, bushfire can and do devastate communities regularly. The consequences of these can lead to long-term personal, social, economic and environmental losses and challenges. These challenges and their prevalence years after disaster were the focus of a University of Melbourne 10 years beyond bushfires report. Among other factors, the, the uni's report highlighted that key to disaster recovery is the influence of social networks. Specifically, the report found that people with more connections had better um, outcomes three to four years after the Black Saturday bushfires. We often talk about disaster resilience as being complex and multidimensional, requiring the collaboration of governments, communities, businesses, and individuals. We talk about it being social, community, economic, environmental. Today, we can explore some of these elements of resilience and how they, in fact, overlap. So to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Professor Daniel Aldrich. Professor Aldrich has an extensive portfolio on this subject, and I'm sure many of you already know that and are very much looking forward to hearing from him today. Daniel's journey in disaster recovery uh, and inquiry on what assists disaster resilience uh, began in 2005, when you may not be aware, but his family home was destroyed in Hurricane Katrina. If I recall correctly, not very long after moving there, but anyway. Um, <coughs> Daniel observed that uh, in the aftermath that the community's recovery was not dependent on how much dam damage had been caused, not dependent on how much money was available. The most significant influence on recovery were the community's connections. These connections not only assisted with facilitating what the community needed to recover, uh, but connected individuals to the community for the longer term when leaving altogether might have been an easier option. So thank you for joining us today, Daniel. We That's have right. a great deal we'd like to learn from you. Um, maybe for those who uh, don't know as much about your research and are perhaps new to it, um, could you begin by saying hello and introducing yourself in any way that you like? 
and then explaining to us uh, the importance of social capital in disaster recovery, resilience, and risk reduction. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Morton. So yes, I was in 2005, my work was on a different field completely. And then when Hurricane Katrina came and the levees filled in New Orleans, our home, our possessions, my hard drive, everything we owned was destroyed. And really forced me to begin thinking about this concept of what it means to be resilient in the face of a disaster and what factors will help us recover. And the vision I had for recovery was pretty naive. I had this vision that either the state would step in, our organization is not NEMA, but FEMA, and this vision that FEMA would come to my door with a big check saying, don't worry, we'll buy all your stuff back. Or that insurance, the market would somehow save us, insurance would come through. And the funny thing was neither FEMA nor uh, market came through for us, in fact, pretty much at all. And the only aid that we got, whether that was an offer of a new job, since mine was suspended, or schools for our children, or even clothes to wear, came not from, again, the market or the state, but from the networks of people that we kind of knew, and those that we knew even better, and those that we didn't know at all. And we just, I began thinking about what role do these kind of connections play? They're called social ties or social capital. Uh, during during these shocks and disasters, and I began to wonder if my own story involved them as a crit critical resource, would that be the story someplace else? So I spent about a year and a half after Hurricane Katrina traveling in India and Japan, studying other disaster sites, and really began to become quite convinced of the evidence that our different types of connections, bonding, bridging, and linking social capital, or bonding of people that we know quite well, family and kin, and bridging of people we know not as well, friends of friends, people that are beyond our immediate circles, and then linking ties to people in authority, so a premier, a mayor, someone in charge and power. Those three different connections and their balance that we have in them really influences how we do or don't recover. And we found this to be the same, by the way, in Japan, as it was in Mexico, as it was in Israel, as it was in North America. So this wasn't just some one-time moment that we found these to be true. And here, too, I think, uh, from the small work that I've done in Australia, uh, along with Renee, I've seen very strongly the work uh, of social ties and social connections. In fact, we have with us someone, Fiona, who herself, I would say, argue, uh, saved the lives of many. And her connections to them, and then her connections to other business owners, those are what help people's lives get saved in those fires on Kangaroo Island. I'm really looking forward to hearing more from Renee and Fiona uh, as part of the seminar, and it'll be great to, to learn more from, from them about what's happened on the ground. Um, I know that you're here in Australia as a Fulbright Distinguished Chair, which sounds terribly important, <laughs> I have to say. It means I have a, um, a nice office to myself. That's really the biggest bonus that I get. Excellent. Uh, and you're based at Flinders University. I know there'll be curiosity. Can you talk to us a little about the work that you're doing at Flinders University and what your current research is looking at? Yes, so several things. You know, one is uh, thanks to organizations like Resilient Ready, I've been traveling around the country to the Blue Mountains, Kangaroo Island, and other sites to talk to business owners and councils about how their own ties helped or what didn't help during those disasters and shocks and gathering information, but also more broadly thinking really hard about the places and spaces in our society that help us build these kinds of ties. And hopefully all of us right now have friends and family who support us if, for example, we broke our leg or our car broke down, right? We can immediately think of people in our circles who might come through with uh, groceries delivery or a ride to the office. But more broadly speaking, I'm wondering now in my research, how do we find those kind of ties to be strengthened? What kind of things can build them up? And a lot of my factors in Australia come from what we're calling now social infrastructure. And these are the spaces and places in society, like pubs, parks, I can't think of a third P word, uh, and places that we build these ties. That might be an escape room or a karaoke bar. It might be a, a, a private place nearby, or it could be an open citizen's hall or, or rural hall in the middle of nowhere. And uh, the more stories that I hear from things like uh, the Black Summer, for example, and other events, I've heard a lot of Australians telling me about the importance of these kind of gathering places for them to build those kinds of connections and then to maintain them even through a shock or a disaster. What about we say playgrounds? I think playgrounds are a yes, good option. Yes, absolutely. Parks and playgrounds, absolutely. And again, yeah. for people with parents, like we are oftentimes the first people that we meet when we go into a new city, like we move to Adelaide, or people at the libraries and at the parks. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. So uh, just in a moment, we're going to be talking to participants involved in that, uh, in the development of the Kangaroo Island Business Climate Roadmap which, um, as you know, is a Resilient Ready initiative. Can you just give us some background in how you became involved in that work and how it relates to this research? 
Absolutely. So I was very lucky uh, to have Renee as a guide for a number of years now. We've been talking back and forth, and she has long been understanding the recognition of the, of the power of these ties of social capital during shocks and disasters. And rather than trying to push, for example, that some outside influence or outside aid be the pillar of recovery, Renee's understood, uh, as do I, that the community itself already has many of the resources they need to recover. And oftentimes it just means helping people locally think through what kind of ties do they have and what kind of ties are lacking there. So I've been fortunate to work as an advisor on a number of projects, including an earlier survey that we did in Kangaroo Island of a number of the business owners there to understand to what degree are they connected to each other, to the government and to their neighborhoods. And I, I think we had some good findings. We also had some findings that indicated there's a lot of work to be done as typically this is the case around the world. Uh, because oftentimes we're so busy doing our own jobs, uh, just getting food on the table, paying our mortgages, getting our kids to footy, whatever else it is that we don't really think about systematically the kind of ties that we do or don't have, especially for small business owners who already may have been hurt or, or affected by a fire or a flood in their community, adding one more thing to think about can be too much. And I think what, what we're trying to do with Kangaroo Island and other places in, in, in Australia is to think through what are easy ways that we can activate those social ties or build them if they're lacking. And again, what we did find is a number of people told us that either they didn't see the value in networking. Some people kind of said, well, you know, you pay money to join an organization. That's one kind of network, right? Those are industry groups. Um, that's unfortunate that they have that association that the ties that you come, come from buying them. Oftentimes, of course, you don't need to buy that industry group association to get involved. There are a lot of things that are available for free. But the other thing that we saw was even people who had gone to those didn't see the value necessarily in sticking with that kind of work. And I think really what we're trying to do here is to help people think through, you know, it's not just in Kangaroo Island or the Blue Mountains or anywhere else in Australia. Uh, these are universal challenges for us now across the globe as we have more fires, as we have more heat waves or more droughts or more floods. We're going to need more and more ability for the communities themselves to have resilience. One of my favorite quotes actually came from New Zealand of all places, when one of my colleagues was talking to a group of business people and he said to them, well, if there's a major disaster, when do you think people in uniforms will show up at your door? And they said, well, you know, probably three or four hours. He said, actually, it could be a week or two. And he was talking from Wellington where they have a huge earthquake and tsunami risk. So if there's a major earthquake or disaster there in New Zealand, it could be two weeks before people show up at your door. That means we, and I'm not pointing to anyone else, but me, I and my neighbors, we and our colleagues really need to be thinking, okay, what, how am I connected? Do I know my neighbors nearby? If they're, again, if there's a, a broken leg, if there's a fire, we actually had a fire in our home in Boston before we came here. And we're really fortunate to know our neighbors quite well. We got everyone out of their homes well before the fire department arrived. So that's the kind of response that you really want, right? Not one where you're thinking to yourself, if something goes wrong here, if there's a, a COVID-19 outbreak or if there's a fire, we're going to be we're taken care of by someone else. It's nice to have that. And maybe some communities do have the luxury of getting assistance quickly from outside agencies. But what we do see often, and unfortunately, just like we're going to hopefully from Fiona, is that in many cases, those outside agencies don't have the knowledge of what's going on locally. They don't know who's on the island and who isn't, for example. They don't know how to get them someplace. They don't know where the safest places to go. So it's, it's our networks, especially among business owners, but residents as well, who know things locally. They know where to go. They know where it's safe. They have experiences in the community, and they know who might need help. Really, this is all an attempt, again, not to say that some outside expert is doing this. These are all internal resources in these communities that can really build, build resilience to these kinds of shocks. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, so building on that and thinking about um, community resilience and, and reducing risks, I'm particularly interested in, uh, and maybe without stealing the thunder of Fiona and Renee for later, um, can you give us some tangible examples of recovery initiatives that really develop this social capital uh, and, and perhaps from your work here in Australia or from elsewhere, some tangible stories would be terrific. Sure, so I'll, I'll go outside Australia to leave um, space uh, for Renee and Fiona and talk about their experiences here, but I'll, I'll tell you one, uh, which is in San Francisco. And there in San Francisco, they know there's a major shock coming in the next few years. A huge earthquake will probably come and wreck about a third of the buildings that exist there. Many of these older plastic and concrete buildings will be in trouble when that earthquake arrives. And the city knows they can't get to every building in time and they kind of fit every building with those big cross posts to make them stronger. So San Francisco has recognized that the way they're going to invest in resilience is not to be through some, again, outside agency, but it's going to be people in the community building strong ties. And it's through a fun way. And this is the other thing I, I like about social ties. 
Oftentimes, it doesn't have to be through an industry association or paying money to a conference. Uh, San Francisco is actually helping local communities hold parties. We would call them sausage sizzles, I think, here in LA Saturday, that's what we call them, a sausage sizzle. And each block gets money from the government to hold that kind of event. So that's an event right there where, again, there's no pressure about doom and gloom. It's really about thinking the positive spillover from building those kinds of connections. So even just organizing who brings the guacamole, who brings the chips, who's getting the bounce house for the kids, that kind of process of organizing the community, again, in a very mundane, positive activity, much in the same way we can build social ties through just talking to a neighbor, right? Inviting over a client for a discussion of the field or the industry. It doesn't have to be a very formal process. Um, and it can take place in a short period of time too. It again, doesn't need to be a five day retreat, right? With, with the entire community, it can just be pockets of people building those connections. But San Francisco recognizes because of these kind of upcoming shocks, there's no way that they can promise that a firefighter or a FEMA agent or a police officer or anyone else will be on the scene. And they really want communities to recognize inside them now, they have many of the abilities they need to cooperate and collaborate well before the shock. And I would just add one more thing here. I think that's really the important message we want to send, right? Right now, fortunately, much of Australia, whether it's Kangaroo Island or other places, is between shocks. I'm not going to say there's no shock coming because that's not true. But it's between like COVID-19 COVID is kind of ebbed out of our consciousness, right? The bushfires we're still recovering from, but we know there's going to be another shock coming soon. So oftentimes it's just easier to say, well, look, we already had COVID-19. We're kind of done, right? There's not, no more pandemics are coming, or we had a fire already. We had a flood already, we're done. I think this is where we get the community to have those connections, not because a disaster is coming, but because you want to have a positive place to live. I think about all the times, the spillovers, that, that is the other things that come out of having strong social ties. Having neighbors nearby means people remember your birthday. Right? Having people nearby means you can go on a walk and feel safe in your community. Having people like you know means if you need something, you can borrow it from them. Right? There are all kinds of positive things that social capital and social ties produce that have nothing to do with the doom and gloom of a shock. Right? So if they come from those peacetime or blue sky moments, and I think that for me is the great part about social ties. We don't need to wait right, for those kind of really negative moments to think, OK, do I have enough contacts nearby? Do I know the first and last names of 10 neighbors? If there were a broken leg in my family, would I be able to put together a round robin of assistance, right? Those are the kind of sort of mundane activities I think that really can drive this conversation. And it's so interesting. I'm quite sure we will get to funding as, as a topic through the questions, if not before. But those things don't require a government grant either. You can have dinner in your house. You can have a street party uh, without having to be funded by somebody else. That's so right. we we can all drive this for ourselves. Exactly. Uh, Rather than waiting, you know, and this is the other thing, you know, one more side which is that often grants are competitive. That means it's yeah. one NGO competing against the other NGO. And whoever gets first past the post, they get the grant. Well, we don't want people in the community thinking, I don't like you anymore because you did win or because you didn't win. Right. We want people thinking we're in this together. Right. So oftentimes yeah. grant the grant making process, it's great to get assistance from whether it's the Southern Australian government or the, the national government. But the reality is we want people thinking. Even if I don't get a grant, these kind of resources are things that are on our table right now to work on, whether that grant comes in or not. And not that I'm against grants. Right. I'm, I'm sure grants. you're not I'm, That's why I'm here. I'm here because of a Fulbright, which is a grant, right? But again, even if without that, we'd want to be thinking, yeah. okay, do we have those ties? Do we have the connections? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm interested to explore um, investment in building resilience. And I... Um, uh, as you know, I was in the audience, I don't know, there's so much going on in work at the moment, uh, somewhere in the last fortnight, uh, as, you, as you sat on stage in Melbourne, um, and the topic of investing in resilience building work came up. So from what you've seen and heard while you've been here in Australia, and I know that you've visited a number of times, what do you think about the priorities for investment? What sort of thoughts do you have about what needs investment at the moment to build this social capital? Yeah, I, I think we really need to sort of flip the script on how we envision the government, whether it's regional or national or, or local. And again, in my, in my experience, the best kind of responses are bottom up ones built in the community. So not that they're being told, you know, some expert like me, supposedly coming in from the outside or some government person comes in and tells you what to do. But the shape and form of these kind of responses to build resilience should be bottom up and organic. 
right? So for example, if at Fiona's caravan compound, people regularly got together and had coffee or a moment or they had a drink together, we don't want someone coming and tell them, oh, no, that's not going to work. We need something else, right? That was working, right? We need to think about how do we expand that? How do we bring more people into that kind of moment? So for me, investments really should be a question who's controlling the purse strings? How do we make sure local people, NGOs, residents, business owners, how do we make sure they're on the front lines of deciding where does that money go? And I can just talk briefly if it's okay. A lot of the money that's spent right now in disaster risk reduction, reducing our risks to threats like climate change or floods, oftentimes come from existing plans that were there even before this was discussed by the newest politicians. There was some national plan to build more roads or build more levees or build more dams. And oftentimes these new programs get rolled into them. Well, that's not necessarily what the community wants, right? I know I was speaking uh, with the community in, in rural Northern Queensland. They said for them, the top priority had nothing to do with big roads or dams or fire breaks. It was about a very small hall, uh, literally the city hall where they had met before. That was the only thing they needed back because without that hall in their place, in, in the community, they had no place to meet. Right? And it gets pretty darn hot in some of their communities, they said. So that was a thing. And again, from the outside, that wasn't obvious. And no one had asked them, well, what is your priority in this process of building this resilience? Where's it going to come from? So I think part of that rethinking of this overall space of funding and, and DRR, disaster risk reduction, is to what degree does the community have a say in the form and shape of what they're investing in, the kind of strategies that they're taking on? And I had, I had a chance to sit on some of the business councils, uh, both, both in Kangaroo Island and also in the Blue Mountains. And again, I saw local businesses, local business owners, local residents debating how do we want to build our community now? How do we want to have a forward facing thing for the next shot? What can we do now to build social cohesion? How do we have those parties, those events, salsa sizzles? What do we do? And I thought that was fantastic. That's what we want. We don't want a community saying, well, we're not really experts on this, right? Get some person with a PhD from Monash or whatever to come in. No, we want them to think this we know works well. Um, and by the way, all the more so for communities that are um, internally divided for different reasons, right? Or communities that have different types of people in them. We want all of those voices at the table. Um, because again, without them, it's hard to build cohesion in the community if only one group shows up to every meeting. Yeah, I could not agree more. Fabulous. What I'd like to do at this point is invite uh, Renee to join us. Thank you, Daniel. We'll, we'll continue to have this conversation with you. Now, for those uh, uh, participating online, you'll notice that we have uh, Renee, Fiona and Maria all on the slide you're looking at. I do need to um, apologise. Maria's been unable to join us today. She's um, unavailable suddenly and unexpectedly, and I know she'll be disappointed. Uh, so we do have, however, Renee and uh, Fiona joining us. So let me introduce Renee for the moment. Um, Renee Hanvin is the CEO and founder of Resilient Ready. And Resilient Ready has been working with business owners and operators on Kangaroo Island to develop a roadmap toward a more resilient business community. In developing the roadmap, Resilient Ready has leveraged the principles of social capital by bringing together the business owners and operators to a workshop about what makes disaster resilient business. This work follows a survey that Resilient Ready undertook in the Blue Mountains. The resulting white paper report revealed many business owners lack the broad and diverse networks that would assist them to mitigate future so shocks and to recover from them efficiently. So the importance of resilient businesses is not individual. Businesses are the backbone socially and economically viable communities. I grew up in a small community. I now live in a regional town. Businesses are indeed the backbone socially and economically. So <clears throat> they also provide community members with a sense of place. And in many ways, they're the cornerstone of resilient community. So joining uh, Renee will be Fiona uh, Jago, a local business owner of the Western Kangaroo Island Caravan Park. So I'll welcome Renee and uh, Fiona and I'll pass over to you. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks so much. Um, and it's great to have the opportunity to share the wonderful work we've been delivering um, on Kangaroo Island. So I'd just like to share this project. Um, the Kangaroo Island Business Climate Roadmap has been developed under a SAFECOM disaster risk redu reduction grant. And I'd just like to recognise that because in the process of the grant process, they actually activated social capital. We submitted uh, directly and they connected us or proposed suggestions for us to connect to the local uh, a council organisation and also uh, a government department. So we have since 
collaborated with the Kangaroo Island Business Hub and the Department for Industry, Innovation and Science. So even that I think is a really progressive step in terms of how a grant program can work. So on the next slide, I'm just going to take you through some um, aspects relating to the project. So we had a three-step strategic approach, very much based around place-based resilience. It's always about co-designing with the local community. I think Margaret and Daniel have just shared, obviously, the importance of that grassroots up. And we know that we are not the experts in the community, but we can bring some expertise. So making sure that we have really firm uh, approaches for how we co-design to benefit the local community. We then created and launched a risk reduction tool led by a local community theme that I'll share with you in a minute. But it's not just about that. It's about having a tool and an opportunity and some learning for the local community to then have something that they can take and embrace and make sustainable. So we're really excited about the next phase, even though our project has just formally uh, finished. So on the next slide, I just want to, I guess, give you a little bit of a background in terms of how we came up with the theme. So we had 18 on our steering committee and we voted, um, there were three themes that pretty much came up. Climate adaptation is a really big uh, focus on Kangaroo Island, which is really wonderful. Um, and part of the discussion was how do we integrate climate adaptation with business? So the comments that we heard was that Kangaroo Island is really ready for conversations and they need to adapt to a changing climate but also that it would be disservice not to try to mainstream the terminology. So we had the conversations around, do we include climate without mentioning climate? Um, how do we make it work? So overwhelmingly 65% uh, absolutely wanted climate part of it. So we identified that business climate enabled us to bring in both the environmental and the economic aspects. So small businesses and all businesses on Kangaroo Island are really in a changing business climate for multiple um, natural hazards and other obvious reasons. On the next slide, it'll give you a quick overview of our risky bus or business workshop approach. Uh, we worked with um, Maria Waters from the Kangaroo Island Business Hub and Susie, her predecessor, to try and create a really, I guess, fun and innovative approach to running workshops. So we actually had mystery tours, mystery bus tours. And yes, there was a poster with a man in his undies, if you're thinking about Risky Business uh, and Tom Cruise. So what we did was we organised um, people to meet in central locations. They hopped on the bus. They had no idea where they were going. And what we did was we actually took them to either their own business or new areas across the island that had changes in business. So we rocked up at one point to uh, Lucy, who's driving a new wool uh, business there. And it was literally the groundworks. They're about to start, but they were, they were about to start building at the time. And it was a really great way of bringing in our surveys and the research that we needed to um, find with conversations about what's happening in the business community on the ground. And the next slide will share you, I guess we created a findings report um, and part of the conversations which really resulted in us understanding that peer-to-peer -peer supported micro learning really resonated with what Kangaroo Island was at the time being a very fatigued community. So we really heard loud and clear, don't do something new, don't do something hard. This is what's already happening in the community that we're committed to and that we want to do. So we were really conscious and really wanted to support um, the tool and the, the program that we were delivering to be supportive of what was already happening in the community, not something else just for the, fake, uh, for the sake of it. So the next slide gives you a quick overview of what the uh, uh, Kangaroo Island Business Climate Roadmap tool is. So it's a really simple approach which has 16 yes or no questions and they're aligned to our resilient ready methodology. We focused on understand your business, know your risks, plan your response, and build your networks. So very much focusing on how do you understand the foundations of your business? How do you know what those risks are? How are you planned or what do you need to do to plan? And then obviously um, the social capital aspect. So what are your networks? By completing those yes, no questions, everyone gets a scorecard, which basically gives them, I guess, a percentage reading as to where they are at the moment. And then they get access to micro learning modules. So our micro learning modules are focused on five minute learning intervals. We got a lot of feedback that we uh, business people are not going to spend 40 minutes on a big plan that's going to get digital dust, but they would actually spend, say, 10 times doing five minutes and one new thing at a time. 
So the roadmap dashboard is basically the access to the modules. Even if they answer yes, they still get access to the modules so they can watch, uh, again, the little nudge theory um, steps of information that we can share. On the next slide, it just gives an overview of the 16 module themes. So everything from essential operations to uh, revenue streams, climate change impacts, uh, unexpected disruptions and, and hazards specifically because these businesses are operating uh, off the mainland and on an island. Um, can't keep going. We had a lot of uh, people interested in, well, what's the succession plan if I want to retire? What, what's, what's the closure of my business going to mean to me and also to the community? And then towards the end, you'll see next door saviour, competitor collaborations, co-designing local community uh, local solutions, and uh, business network members very much focused on that social capital. And I had the privilege of going to Kangaroo Island many times, but once over a week to film sixteen local business case studies, of course, yeah, including Fiona, and it was a fantastic opportunity to really hear how each of these module themes and topics can change and learn from the lived experiences from these 16 business owners that all feature in a module. And I just want to share, we pay business people to participate because if they're taking time out of their day, not earning revenue to contribute to a community tool, then we believe that they should be uh, incentivized and rewarded as well. So on the next slide, it shares, I guess, what we capture from the tool and it's some really innovative data. So we can understand uh, the responses to the questions. So things like 5%, uh, I think that's meant to be 50% don't know their essential operations, right down to 48% uh, don't know how climate change will impact their essential operations. 33% um, don't think they could survive another disaster. And 20% um, can't rate uh, potential risks from high to low. So that kind of information, I guess, helps us understand where the businesses in the communities are, where their capabilities are and where their gaps are. And on the next slide, just a few more, it says 71% uh, don't have a climate adaptation plan for their business. 24% um, don't have the right people structure. And that's one of the core uh, issues on Kangaroo Island. 75% uh, don't have a disaster preparedness plan with a next door business. Um, and 43% aren't a member of any KI business network. So again, utilizing this data, and we share all the data back with the local community, in particular the KI Business Hub, who we are uh, collaborating with, we can then identify conversations and networks and connections and initiatives that can be created to reduce those gaps and to build uh, the resilience and the knowledge within the people across the community. On the next slide, I'm excited to share that we have just recently published this week our last uh, latest white paper. So doing business differently in a changing climate roadmap for the Kangaroo Island business community. I really welcome you to read it and see the findings. We also have a white paper um, from the Blue Mountains, which was a slightly different project. But I'm so grateful to have uh, Daniel Aldrich participate in a lot of our programs and he's uh, contributed to this white paper as well. So just in terms of wrapping up, I guess, from our perspective, um, the projects that we're doing on the next slide, um, thanks, Greg, it's all about, I guess, small steps towards a bigger outcome. So creating this tool, and we are committing to um, three years, so we're outside of the funding of the project, we are supporting Kangaroo Island over three more years to share the data with them and help them with driving conversations relating to each of the 16 modules. We are working with Maria um, from the KI Business Hub to embed this tool across the community. And we have, I guess, visions of expanding it um, through other themes or other modules once they're identified by the community. But it's really a key driver of creating those connections and creating social capital. And I guess it's a really great example of how a tool like this and the work that we do at Resilient Ready is about translating policy. So the government policy and the government frameworks are all great for a nice shiny document, but what are they going to mean to the people like Fiona? So very much around um, the work that we're doing is, again, activating and translating that policy into everyday behaviour. Now, I'm really excited to introduce to you Fiona Jago. Fiona is the owner of Western KI Caravan Park, which is in the west side, obviously, of um, Kangaroo Island. Uh, Fiona is an exemplary example of an amazing community person who happens to own a business. Um, so I've just got a few questions um, that I'd like to share. I already know the answers, but to share with you. 
So when I use examples of businesses, and for those that um, have gone straight to the big corporate organisations, 98% of global and Australian businesses are actually small. So they're either micro people, just one man bands, or those with up to three or up to 19 employees. And I often use the term of from hairdressers to caravan park owners because it helps to explain the difference between the retail city and the kind of uh, suburban. And I have since found my real life caravan park owner representative. Um, and we have a number of events that we're uh, talking um, and presenting our um, project with coming up. So can you tell uh, our viewers today about Western Car Caravan Park, why you moved to Kangaroo Island and uh, to run a business and what's so great about running a business there? So my husband, Mark, and I um, bought the Western KI Caravan Park in 2015. We had our midlife crisis. We left all of our family behind in Victoria and thought we'd run a caravan park. Can't be that hard. Um, be crazy. It's like being on holidays all the time, apparently. So we had never done this before. Very... Um, green in the process but we made it work we've got there so we had a 10-year plan we'd assess after five and then that fifth year our park burnt down in the fires so yeah it's been a whole like learning process from go to woe yeah and, and I know um Fiona I don't want to ask anything that you don't feel comfortable sharing but obviously you were at the uh, western end of the island so you're able to share, I guess, what the impact to you and your business and I guess the community was from the bushfires and then obviously COVID, which happened um, shortly afterwards. Yeah, so 3rd of January 2020, when the fire took off in the western end of Kangaroo Island, basically to give it 50% of the island burnt in one day, all of the western end, basically. We had a community of businesses around us as well and we're on the... Uh, edge of the national park. So there's a fair bit happens at this end of the island. Um, after the fires, when we could finally come back, we come back and found that we had toilets because they don't burn because they're concrete. Um, some cabins, but basically lost 85% of our park in the fire. We evacuated 250 people that day. Uh, we had our own evacuation plan and how to manage the people. Coming back and since that time in like-minded businesses we're currently the only viable business still running so we've rebuilt over the last three years um still still building <laughs> a couple of cabins to come in another month but you then understand how having a community around you makes a big difference to your business as well and Fiona, when um, we visited recently and Daniel, who's going to join us in a minute, was um, he was there as well. So we came and we spent a day with you. And I think what I've heard so much about every time that I've um, spoken with you is that you have this wonderful, I guess, preemptive focus around what you needed to do to get your business ready. So you clearly understood the risks and you said you've never run a caravan park before, but you clearly went out of your way to understand the risks and you set your business up and the structures around your business. And I know you've said a couple of times that you were perhaps the only or one of a few businesses that had business interruption interruption insurance, for example. So you can share with me, what did you do beforehand that I guess set your business up to actually sort of survive and get to that pay, uh, place where you are one of the only re ones rebuilding? Um, I've always been a firm believer, if you can't afford to insure it, don't own it. Uh, so to if something was to happen, and it could be any number of things in today's world, business interruption is a big portion of it. We were able to keep paying our employees, so that kept them in the community. Um, we were able to honour all of our cancelled bookings and all of those things, and, but the generosity of people is amazing, of who said, no, nah, keep it, you need it more than we do, which is amazing. Um, you get to see all sides of people. Uh, in that process and the other big thing for us was our relationships with uh, our bank our insurance broker our insurance assessor and then also our trades big time with our trades we were able to get a plan together we had too much left to walk away from not that that's me um so we were able to have our trades 
ready. We had everything ordered within the month so that once the fire was complete, we were able to move forward with that and start rebuilding. We'd given ourselves the aim of being ready for Easter, which we were, and then COVID come along. So that was just a little gift that kept giving. Um, it was a double whammy for us, COVID. Um, we were able to rebuild without too many guests. Once we could have in interstate travel, meant we could operate and build without having too many people around. If that had been in a traditional season, we would have had to remain closed. We couldn't manage the 100 people a day that we get through prior to Christmas. It would have been too much. And I think one of the biggest learnings, um, obviously, that we advocate for and I've heard from you is very much around, you know, businesses, I guess, generate the livelihoods. So a business is just not an operating entity that's kind of, you know, a system or a thing. Businesses, I guess, um, you know, you work in a business to create the livelihood that you can then pay to live. So it's kind of one of those um, um, kind of wicked cycles, I guess, in a sense. And from what I've just heard from you saying there, I think linking back into um, Daniel's uh, social capital, having those connections beforehand of your insurance broker and of your bank and, you know, identifying who they are, obviously from a household perspective, but also from a business perspective is fundamental because you need to not only know what you've got and that you've got the right um, policy or the right um, bank detail, you know, bank account or whatever, but you then need to know who you need to go to at that time when you need them most um, as well. You need to trust them. If you don't trust them before a disaster, you definitely won't trust them after a disaster. So you've got to have confidence in those people that you deal with in all of your day-to-day -day runnings of a business um, because you have to lean on them a lot to get through what you need to get through. And, again, most of that comes from setting up those connections um, and building that trust beforehand. So just my last question before we bring Daniel in. So you are one of our um, lived experience case studies in the Kangaroo Island Business Climate Roadmap tool. And you we could have put you in for most of them, but we chose module 15, which is called co-design local solutions. And every time I speak to you and come and visit you, I hear about the wonderful decisions and the, the very selfless decisions that you make, made in the sense of how you can rebuild your business back up so that it benefits the community as well. So can you just share, I guess, how did you make those decisions and what are the decisions that meant that your community is going to benefit whilst your livelihood can still get back up and running as well? Uh, so we understand community is a big part of any regional area, but put it on an island, it becomes magnified. So being basically the only viable business down this end of the island we felt we, not just for ourselves, but we owed it to our community to offer more than it was before. Uh, the businesses around us weren't rebuilding at that point. So one of them had fuel. So we got approached to take the fuel on. We said, yeah, no worries, as long as it's automatic because I'm not pumping fuel all day. We got that happening. Um, through the, the generosity of the grants, uh, we were able to make that happen in conjunction with the fuel company um, there was a need for workers accommodation for the rebuilding of the western end of the island um, so we've got we were through a long process we got that through business council australia which was extremely generous um, and we probably assisted in how they run that program now because that on an island is very different to um, somewhere on the New South Wales Central Coast. So there was a bit of a learning curve there. So we've got those 10 rooms that are here, which have been used constantly, whether it be through tree, um, blue gum eradication, researchers of what's survived or not survived through the community. Um, then we've also got a bunkhouse, which used to be around the road from us. They weren't rebuilding. So, and again, it's a way of getting school groups, research groups, all those people back into the Western End who all have something to offer and it keeps our community going. And I have to say, I mean, so credible as a, as a business person example of how to be prepared beforehand, but also just to take on, you know, 
deciding to put a petrol pump in your business is not a small decision. And I just really want to commend um, what you do and what you've done for your community and keep doing for community that's um, obviously building all those connections and um, driving infrastructure requirements in terms of um, daily life from a business perspective. Now, we had the pleasure of bringing uh, Daniel over to Kangaroo. Well, I sound like I'm a local now. So we had the pleasure of bringing um, Daniel over to Kangaroo Island and we did spend a whole day um, with Fiona down at the Western KI Caravan Park. And Daniel, what was the main thing that I think you learned from Fiona in our day down there as a business person, a really active business person, particularly around what she did um, during those days of the bushfires? Well, I think the story that I heard from her, and, and Fiona, please correct me if I'm wrong, but was one where you know she had she knew something was going on as the fire got closer. She had some 250 people staying with her there on site. And when the authorities came by and Fiona asked them, what should I do? Their response was, we really can't give you advice. I remember if I got that right. Yeah, it was a case of we had the community meeting the day before, but when the police came to us and said, you need to go to that meeting, and we said, right, on the day, who's going to tell us when we should leave? And they said, that'll be up to you. We can't, we can't come and get you. So, so that was one thing. So again, this is, this is reinforcing the point that we made before that oftentimes we envisioned that, oh, I'm going to get saved by some authority, which would be great. And again, maybe in some cases the police do that. But I think in Fiona's case, she explicitly said there wasn't some government agency coming down and telling her what to do. But I also noticed really interesting at that same moment was Fiona immediately used her connections or social contacts to find out where can I safely put these people, whether they're Chinese tourists whose English isn't great, but not necessarily where to go, or people who can come maybe get back to the island through a ferry, or people I'll put on the eastern side of the area uh, of, of the island, right? And she had enough knowledge of not only other business people, but also where would be safe for people as this fire got closer. Now, again, that's knowledge that, you know, imagine I had parachuted in as some firefighter. I wouldn't know where to put people. I would have no idea. Right? But Fiona was someone who's a local. She has those connections beforehand. She has the trust as well, right? They trust her. If she calls and says, I have 25 people, right? I need some help. They're not going to say, well, who are you again? Why would I help you? I've got my own stuff. No, because she had established those connections and was a local leader. They said, oh yeah, okay, 25 people, we can fit them here. But these 25 people go here. So I would say personally, those connections worked in two ways. One, it gave her a knowledge of what to do. But she knew, okay, the authorities are not going to give us advice. This would depend on my knowledge of safety here and what the policy. And the second thing was they gave her how to do it, right? Without the connections that she had, when I mean, she couldn't just grab everyone and put them in one of her vans and drive them off. There wasn't space that like, wouldn't be possible. But again, she had the knowledge of other people nearby that she could reach out to. That, that's, I think, the real power. That story for me illustrates the power of social ties. I don't need to have everything ready myself. You know, oftentimes we hear from disaster experts, okay, Daniel, do you have a, a kit with 45 gallons of water and 300 pounds of generator fuel and enough food to feed your family of six for a week? Like most people don't have all those resources. What we saw with Fiona was she didn't need to have them all herself, right? She didn't need to have in her own pocket a backup caravan site and then a place to put people in. A, she didn't need that stuff. She had this network and through the network of people that she had established beforehand, she got them all to safety. And, and to me, that's a great example, right? Where again, it's not that the experts came in or the authorities came in, it's here's a local person doing right because she has those ties and knowledge. And Daniel, I have to say, I mean, we obviously advocate for business community and the role of business people. And I still say they are the untapped nugget and most vulnerable group, particularly small businesses, but they are the biggest opportunity to build resilience, capabilities and knowledge across the country because they connect with customers, employees, suppliers every day. They sell um, goods and services every day. So I think the likes of Fiona and the potential to upskill her as a person and the capabilities to build community resilience is literally ready and waiting uh, for a little bit more funding. Now, Daniel, we launched, sorry, Fiona. I just wanted to add one thing. Um, one of the big lessons out of all of this is know your own business because you need to know your own business to get through it. I That's that. with insurance, everything. You need to know your business. Those ne networks again, right? So if you only, you had the insurance person who you've been working with and trusted, right? And again, ask people, ask you for advice on what to do, as I saw that when we had that event. I mean, so again, these are people that you've built those connections with. You know your business well, not just your business, but in a sense, you know all the other businesses connected to your business, right? So now you know petrol, right? Now you know your insurance, right? Now you know how building processes. So, so that's, that's the fascinating thing here. Now, I, I think oftentimes when people think about disasters and resilience, 
we do unfortunately think about, well, people in uniform, right? The, the state agencies that, that do stuff, and then there's everybody else. But it's kind of the opposite, right? There simply aren't enough people in uniform to go to every door, to go to every caravan park, to go to every business, and either talk to them, upskill them, or give them advice. There isn't time for that, or there isn't availability. What we really need is our communities, right? Networks that are there, again, in the community itself. So again, we're not coming in and telling people, oh, you need to bring in this person or bring in that person or, or parachute this person in. We're saying in the community already is the potential for people to be, be like Fiona, right? To, to make, make those connections, to make them powerful in a moment of disaster. And again, I can only imagine the worst case scenario would be, let's say Fiona, you just gotten there a few days beforehand yourself, just opened your business didn't know anybody else on the island, they didn't know it, right? So those are the kind of the worst case, right? When people who live there don't have those networks. Um, I mean, I'm a good example. I was in New Orleans for less than six weeks. I didn't know anyone, right? And the only reason that we escaped from New Orleans with our lives at the time, family of four with two young kids, was because one neighbor came over to our house. We didn't listen to any of the authorities because we didn't trust them. We didn't know who Mayor Nagan was. We didn't know anyone else. Uh, and the only person who literally knocked on our door and said, you really need to get out now before those levees break was a neighbor named Kathy who we just met like a week beforehand, right, in a faith-based organization nearby. And again, that's the kind of moment where if you don't have those ties beforehand, it's going to be a much different story, right, during that shock. And Daniel, I just want to share, so we launched this tool, just as a, a last question, we launched this tool at the um, place to be on Kangaroo Island for events at the Kangaroo Island Airport. And I did say to Daniel, we're launching uh, the tool in an airport. And he looked at me like I was Australian. <laughs> I was talking in a different language, but it's a really great venue. Um, and what I really liked about the launch, which we were so grateful to you, ha have you there and you shared um, your um, obviously social ties and whatnot, was it really created just that event and we talked about the 16 modules and one of them is that next door saviour, knowing your business next door neighbour, but having some of the case study people present and then having you respond to their questions, like so many I guess answers were just identified and, and topics were discussed just at that point of you know coming together for two hours. And I'm really excited that there's this tool that again you've been part of is I guess is part of the conversations that Maria is going to be embedding into the community for uh, three years. But what did you learn from the business people that attended uh, the launch event? Yeah, I heard some amazing stories. So a Fiona story I heard from her directly earlier in the week. And then I heard other stories also of what I would call social infrastructure businesses that served as the sites of connection. One was the Nash's coffee shop. Uh, this was a husband and wife duo who had a coffee shop there. And they told me this amazing story about how an elderly farmer there in the community came into their coffee shop several days after the fire and his hands had been hurt. He looked a little bit down. And because they knew him, they were able to talk to him and say, like, what's going on? He said, look, you know, I have this thing I need to get done on my farm. I'm not a farmer, for excuse me, but basically connecting these pipes and getting irrigation flowing. But I, I can't do it right now. And if I don't do it soon, I'm going to lose this crop. And immediately the Nash is able to say, look, don't worry, right? We have these connections to this other group. And in fact, it was a whole group of Australian soldiers who had come in, weren't doing much. And the Nashes were that link between the two people, one person who needed something done. Um, you know, it wasn't a huge ask. And, and these volunteers were to do that work to get in there and help out. I think that was a great example, right? Of how places like a coffee shop or a caravan park. And again, if you ask an expert like me, where does disaster decision-making take place? Where does disaster reduction take place? We're gonna tell you, oh, well, you know, at the top levels of government in the cabinet office, the, the reality is that coffee shop helped out that local more than anyone else. Because if he hadn't had that connection to the Nashes, who were connected to the, to the soldiers, he would never have had that crop plan. The same with Fiona. Fiona's presence there, they all the difference for those people in her caravan park. So for me, hearing the stories of how these businesses serve as sites of connection, and again, not that we need to have someone from the outside making up some kind of formal plan, but already on the, on the inside, the Nash has already decided, right? They have people buying coffee for the people, they had a whole program, right? Where people around the country can donate money and then people will get coffee for free. Locals who were maybe a little short on cash as they're trying to rebuild or getting out of, out of the fire. So those kind of moments, right? When a local business can be the site of recovery or the site of disaster risk reduction, right? Reducing the risk to people. Again, not because there's a big seawall there or some kind of fancy technology there, but just because people are talking to each other. And I think that's really for me the takeaway message that I got from being in Kangaroo Island that I've seen so many times now. It's not that we need to have some fancy technology or anything else. We get our assistance, we get our, our resilience from people in the community itself. Agree. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel and Fiona, uh, for joining me today. And um, again, thanks. Uh, handing back to Margaret now, but really appreciate um, Ada and the opportunity to share what we've been doing on Kangaroo Island. 
Thanks, Renee, and thanks, Fiona, and thanks, Daniel. And one of the fun things about not being on screen is that none of you can see how I'm sure not only myself, but 168 people, given all the clapping hands that we can see on our screen, have been nodding madly while you've all been having this conversation. And um, uh, no offence to either Daniel or Renee, but a particular thank you, Fiona, to you. Uh, coming on to one of these things is not necessarily your everyday idea of fun. Uh, and you've done a magic job. It's interesting as I was listening to you because my first task is to pick a couple of takeaways that were particularly resonant. And my paper is full of so many scribbles because your experience on KI and the way that uh, Renee and Daniel and Fiona, you've all described how this worked, has 101 million takeaways. But I do have three I just wanted to particularly mention while I encourage um, all the people online to hop into the Q&A and perhaps uh, vote for a question you'd particularly like me to ask and or add a question uh, because we'll be doing that in just a moment. I really liked one of the very, very early comments about invest in what is already happening. It, you know, this is a locally led. People ask me, how do we do community led? How do we do locally led? Well, it's called, you know, walk the, walk the ground in the community and support and invest in what's already there. I really liked that. And then I loved, the, I loved Fiona, the know your business. Know your business. And I was thinking based on everything you'd all been saying, know your business really well and, and know your um, other community businesses kind of connect to each other, which is what you've all been pointing out. And um, the whole hairdresser, coffee shop, pub thing reminds me of um, when I first went out to do um, my research on what makes a difference to recovery and indeed social connections was the top and my mother who's now 93 said now now margaret i don't want you to find out that it's the football club i want you to find out that it's the church i came back home and said mum i've got good news and bad news it's the church yay and it's the football club and what <laughs> makes it worse it's the pub as well she did laugh um so all of these places, I'm really interested in your future research, Daniel, because all of these places about where do people go to connect, where are these places and how do we support them? Um, so I am now going to um, have a look at the questions that have come in and we'll, we'll have a bit of a chat about some of these questions. Now, I've been looking at them as they have come in. So, um, and good, you've all been voting. So a very, very popular uh, question is, is hopefully a straightforward one. Uh, Kate has asked, do you see potential for the KI tool to be useful in other locations or would it need adjusting? You know how we say this work needs to be, you know, take in the local context, tailored. So I'm really interested in anyone's view about how do we juggle that? Can it, can it just be useful in its own right or do we need to adjust it? What's your answer in no particular order? So I was gonna say it might make sense for me to jump in at first because we have actually delivered the tool in the Blue Mountains as well. So the Blue Mountains was called the Blue Mountains Business Resilience Roadmap. Uh, different modules, some same, some different, different case studies, different uh, aspects of relevance. I think a tool is a tool. There are components that you can learn that can be really generic. But what we want to do is build that business community, make it relevant to the business community. So we might just be tweaking a couple of modules, certainly tweaking um, and changing the lived experience to make it relevant. But it's not. it doesn't have to be a big process. Um, and we very much want to embed what's happening locally in the tool as well. So I would like it to be industry-based, geographically-based, women in business based, et cetera, um, to have that relevance. But no, we could pretty much use the tool. It's it's very agile. And Daniel's, I mean, he's seen it active a lot as well. So you can no doubt comment. I just want to drop in and say, you know, I think of course every community we just said is exactly different, right? So maybe there's only one Fiona in Kangaroo Island and there's a different person working a similar job or a different job in, in the mountains. But I think what unites all of these different frameworks is the recognition that 
while there are different types of businesses that perhaps active, if there's a chocolatier here and a coffee shop here or a church here, a business here, the, uh, the need for those businesses to connect, the need for the owners to connect and the residents to connect, that's exactly the same. I think that's one of the benefits I have um, from having come seen these other communities around the world, whether Japan, America, Israel, Mexico, is that it's often, again, this, the way they form is quite different. The ties they form are different, but the frameworks for those ties, I mentioned the bonding, bridging and linking ties, those we have found around the world. So it doesn't matter if you're from Japan, if you're from Singapore, from America, Australia, from Mexico, um, you all have those three different types of connections in our lives. People we know really, really well, family and kin, people that we know kind of well, the businesses maybe nearby or churches and schools, and then we have the linking ties. Uh, and I think that that is really the power in the social ties is it's not just it only works in Kangaroo Island. No, that same kind of idea will absolutely work in the mountains and will work in Melbourne and Sydney as well. Do you feel the urge to add to that, Fiona, or are you happy to just say, I agree with them? I agree. <laughs> it is something that can be tweaked to anything. And as I always say, a business is not just a business that has got a shop front. It's a business, whether it be a farming business or a trucking yep. business, anything like that. A business is a business and yep. everyone needs that little prompt occasionally just to revisit their business and what needs maybe tweaking. And I think that's a really good comment too. So we don't restrict it to private businesses. We have not-for-profits. So uh, Marie from the Kangaroo Island Community Centre, she does the lived experience of Next Door Saviour because she talks about her connections and knowing all the businesses and helping the butcher when the trucks couldn't get in, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's even government, dare I say, and councils are businesses too. Yep. Okay, I have, I have a question that's becoming more and more popular. A very large number of people would like to know the answer to this. Uh, how can the different levels of government support community networks? And the question is written to activate, but I wonder whether also there are other ways to finish that question. So how can different levels of government support community networks in all sorts of ways and phases? Can I just jump in quickly with just really quick short, short answer? The first would be make sure whether you're a national, regional or local that you're doing no harm. And it sounds strange, but oftentimes many of the policies that governments put in place with really good intentions do the opposite of what the intent. I'll just give you one quick example from Japan where the goal after a major earthquake is to get everyone out of the community as quickly as possible, to move them out from damaged areas, which sounds great. But what will happen is individual residents will be put randomly in an open apartment, 550, 500 miles away. And what then you have is lots of vulnerable individuals who are now separated from their families, from their doctors, from their businesses, from their daily routines, who now unfortunately have to have a whole new set of things to work through, plus whatever shocks they're facing from the disaster. So they're, again, a well-intended disaster process of getting people out quickly without moving them as a group, that was doing harm. So a lot of times we have to think through first, let's do a really quick scan, is what we're doing immediately afterwards helping or hurting? I'll just give you one other example. Oftentimes speed is the goal of disaster recovery experts, quote unquote. They think, you know what? We only have X number of days or months or weeks before these grants run out, get it done. Which is again, a great idea, but sometimes making decisions will take time, especially after a major shock. And I can testify this myself, uh, deciding do we move back to where we were, do we move ourselves in the community? Do we wanna put our kids back in the same schools or whatever? Those don't take days or weeks sometimes, it can take a lot longer. And having patience again. So I would say whatever, I'm, I'm sure Renee, and if you don't can add to this, but the first thing that I would say was do no harm. Make sure that the government policies in place are being reviewed how do they impact social capital, which I just mentioned a few minutes ago, is not really what we think about, about disaster recovery, right? Disaster is about the, the fire trucks and the, and the spraying hoses and everything else. Not necessarily, what does the community have right now? Are we damaging those existing networks by the plans that we have in place? And just before either Renee or Fiona jump in, because I know they're going to, um, something I'm learning is that, you know, people in governments at all levels will say, Good point, Daniel. Absolutely. Nothing we do should cause harm. Somehow we have to work out how to get people to take a deep breath and stop and go, let me ask another question of myself. How do I know it's not causing harm? How am I checking that? Because of course we'll all say, hand on heart, I agree with you. No harm should be done. And then some decisions are made and you think, hello, that's separating neighbour from neighbour, that's separating families, that's preventing people from getting to the people they love. What are we doing? So 
we somehow have to get, how do you know it's not doing harm? Because I really agree with that. Well, sorry, one last one really quick. Also, even the grant process where we tell communities, you have to fight with each other to get some kind of recovery grant or else you're not getting money for this. That's, that's kind of an insane thing to do. We want them to be at that moment unified. And you're telling business X or NGO Y or school group Z that you're competing against your people nearby with whom you literally are going to have to live for the rest of your life anyway in the community. So again, even the grant process and the recovery and evacuation processes we have to be scanned again as you said really low market what are they what was the actual impact maybe we have to talk to people in the community slow it down ask people like fiona what does this program do to you or for you is it really helpful and if it's not maybe it's worth taking a step back on um, on the um grants situation um i'll add to that as we we're fortunate enough to get one of the black summer initial grants, which enables us to get the fuel in the bunkhouse. It's all time driven to get your grant in, but it's not time driven to get your answer. And that is the most mentally draining process to go through. And we've given this feedback back because we couldn't move forward with our build in places, not knowing whether we were going to get these projects over the line. So you know, a couple of months to get them in and six months to get an answer when you promise month by month by month that, oh, it's going to be the end of this month. It's going to be the end of this month. It is mentally exhausting and you wonder why you bothered actually putting in for it at the time because you're just being a ping pong ball for politicians, unfortunately. And as we say, it's five minutes to burn down, at least five years to rebuild. And in that time, you still need those people around to support you, not just move on to something else that might be shiny at the time. And I guess, Margaret, my answer, and I might quote a uh, person who may be here, people build resilience, not water bottles, not batteries, my own contribution, not roads, not bridges. We need people. Uh, that's Daniel's quote, in case no one knew. Um, <laughs> but we need to recognise that we need people to be um, understanding risks, understanding risk reduction, driving behaviours to reduce those risks. And that I know we say that it can come with not much funding to build connections, but we need to fund national programs to educate people and help people to take uh, and make decisions to reduce those risks, which is what we're aiming to do. So to translate the national policy and framework, because if we can upskill, let's say we upskilled every business person on Penguin Island in 16 tasks or risk reduction behaviours, that is, of course, going to seed into the people that work for them, the people that purchase for them, the people that visit for them. So I think, you know, we need to have an understanding that the first priority, aside from saving lives, needs to be preparing people for what's ahead and that also comes with consequence management which you mentioned before so we've done a lot of consulting in the past to government departments around consequence management and I can tell you we need the chemist 100 kilometers down the road that's serving the uh, that can get the supplies in for the asthma pump for the kid that's got chronic asthma because of the smoke that's coming from 200 meter, uh, kilometers away so it's consequence management but it's people. Mm. Long-term yep. people. And I'm sure that everybody's nodding uh, who's who's watching. Uh, I, I need to do a better job of getting to some of these questions. Uh, a lot of interest in a lot of questions. So um, let's grab that people comment and put them in a different context. Uh, don't vanish, Fiona, but you may or may not have a view on this one. How do we effectively build and operationalize solid networks in bigger cities where people might be surrounded by other people, but not necessarily connected to them? So I don't know who wants to ask somebody who's always lived in a rural environment. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so it's a very different thing for me. So I won't touch that one. <laughs> I'm having to jump in. Country to see girl you. too, Fiona. So I think just yeah. think like country girls. It's not that hard. Easy. Carry on, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think again, it would depend on the community. You want to think through where are people interested already. You want to build something brand new, some brand new, we already some shiny new tool, right? I know actually, it's funny. Oftentimes, you can think about things like pets or children, wine, travel. Like think about broad affinity groups. It doesn't have to be that again. We're getting ready for a disaster. 
right? You can think about what would bring people out for fun, for joy. What would bring people joy? Would it be connecting over, again, a sausage sizzle or a lecture from a disaster expert on how they're all going to die if there's another fire nearby, right? So probably we'll have more people show up with a sausage sizzle, which you might sneak in there, right? Some kind of really quick five minute talk about, okay, you know, it's so happy we could organize this party. Who's gonna help us organize the next event? Or who's ready to get a phone tree going? Or you know anyone who didn't show up? Like who didn't show up at the party? How about you know Mrs. McKillicuddy who's got you know dialysis machine in her house or so-and-so who's got a program problem with diabetes, whatever, right? Those are the kind of people that we don't see necessarily at these events and we want to know about them, right? So I think the first starting point would be what already is bringing joy? Is the library already a center for kids, for new families? Like, you know, I know my family when we first got here, right to the library, right? So what a great place. Could the library be a center for connection? Is there a business nearby, a restaurant to put up science about things, a new event, right? Drawing on things that people already are doing. So I, I'm never a fan of saying, I've got an idea for a brand new kind of thing. Because again, people are like, eh, post-COVID, maybe not. But if, you know, is it eating ice cream in a group? People like that kind of stuff. Is it going to a barbecue outside with music? Great. Is it a free event, right? Sponsored by some local businesses? Even better. So think about, again, to build those connections, what are the ways people connect? So I know as a parent, again, playground, library, those are the kind of things. If you're a pet owner, it's going to be a dog park. I believe there's tons of them. Those are the moments when you have those conversations, right? And again, the power of social infrastructure means you want to meet people that you don't know well already, right? Again, building resilience does not mean I call up my friend from school who've been together for 20 years and say, hey, let's have a beer together. That's really nice. But he knows me already. We already have that trust, right? You want to meet some people that you don't know as well, right, for that cup of coffee. Yeah, I agree, Daniel. And I think too, I mean, I guess moving towards more the COVID, you know, I'm based in Melbourne. We had the COVID lockdown for two years and I was so concerned about the small business uh, owners around here. I ended up renting a space in the travel agent because her business was going to go under and then I reached out to my connection and we had other people renting rooms there as well. So all of a sudden, all the working from home people who had too many kids that needed to get slightly out of the house within the five kilometres, we were renting, coming together in a space that enabled someone's business to stay in business. So I think it's being uh, thinking differently and doing differently in that aspect around how we can all come together and support us all to go through um, the different disruptions that we're facing. I sometimes think um, that people like you and I, Renee, my kids say this about me and I bet people say this about you. I chat to the checkout person. I say thanks to the person on the tram. I, I'm always, you know, thanks a lot. Have a good day. How was your day? I ask the Uber driver. Now, that's just the nature of who we are. Thanks but there'll be many people for whom COVID was a blessed relief because they really don't do that naturally. Um, so it is, it, it is tricky. I think we have to also think of creative ways for people who are not comfortable doing that kind of getting to know people. And I think it is about some of the examples you've all given about finding people like me. So if I'm a quieter person and I read a lot, I can be in a book club and there are quieter things to do too. So I just want to reassure anyone out there who's panicking going, that's just not me. There's a whole range of ways to do this that are not for crazy extroverts like Renee and I. Uh, don't know you well enough to judge, Fiona. Um, She's like us. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, can so I say too, don't forget about online. So Daniel and I have had many, many conversations as well. So online connections is another really important social capital component as well. So if you're in a business and, you know, you don't want to talk to the competitor down the road, connect with other, you know, like-minded business people in other communities and regional communities or whatever as well. So we've been connecting businesses on KI and businesses in the Blue Mountains that have some similarities um, about, you know, having the conversations around, you know, what they're going through, because 99% of it is the same. It's so interesting. I was at a meeting uh, in Canberra this week about resilience, as you do, and um, one of the very influential people in the room talked about on on online opportunities being um, a detractor from social capital and not a, not a useful thing and we should do less of it. And and I was sitting in the audience thinking, mm, I don't agree with you. I do not agree with you. I think there's actually a lot of connections we can use online. And I think we need their name, Daniel, and I think we need to go and have a visit and have a chat. I'd love to do that. Talk to me later. Uh, there is another question, as there's a lot of questions here. I'm going to skip your question, Sue Ford. 
uh, the 10 people who want me to ask it because I think there's just been a stream of ideas through all of these answers. The question is, what are some things we can do in our community to build resilience? Every time any of you open your mouths, you say more. So I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to go to a question about schools. Do industries have opportunities to work with schools to promote the necessity of resilience readiness education? And do any of our speakers have suggestions about how we could strengthen this area of education in particularly secondary schools, although I know of projects in primary schools too. So um, any thoughts about education and how to build this into education? Daniel, do you want to start saying you're the academic? Yeah, there, there are a few um, schools, school programs. I know, I know, for example, in North America, uh, especially during COVID, actually, a lot of them were about things like mental health and broader sort of shock mitigation. How do we make sure that our young people who may have been cut off from their friends, right, locked in their communities, locked in their homes with the parents, which is probably bad for both parents and kids, right, for so long, how do they build that back? So I know there are a number of them out there. Um, and, and some of them are formal curriculum for people to teach. Uh, the funny thing, of course, is, and by the way, this is a sad truth, oftentimes it's in the smaller island nations that have a formal curriculum on disasters, including climate change. And those of us often responsible for the small island nations being underwater don't really teach our kids much about formal ways to build resilience. Because again, in our mind, it's the fire across the water, right? Why would we teach our kids? Um, I'll tell you one more thing about North America, which fortunately Australia doesn't have as much of, which is gun violence. And there are a number of programs in schools now, again, about mental health and gun violence. How do we get our kids to feel, speaking of social anxiety, how about school anxiety, right? My kids often ask me questions like, am I gonna be safe today, right? Do I need to bring an extra phone to school today? So I can be in contact if something happens. So there again are some curriculum that I know of out there, and people are thinking Australia online and protecting right now. Um, so maybe they can give some examples, but some schools explicitly do have programs on building both broader climate change resilience, but also more specifically about mental health. Diana, do you know any from Kangaroo Island specifically? I don't know if it's embedded into the our town or our community program. Yeah, I think there is something in there, but um, I'll pass the kid. It's been a while since I've had kids um, and my family isn't on the island. So, um, But I think there needs to be an awareness put into schools and it doesn't have to be over the top scaremongering of the kids. Um, it just of them knowing that it's there is a way through it, through their community, not just their parents or their school. It can be with the footy club and then it can be just hanging around together and that they can support each other and they need to know it's okay to support each other and if they have a cry that's okay too because there's too much I know from my own granddaughter she's worried every time there's a, a lightning strike now that she's seven and that nanny's house is going to burn down again I don't have it to burn down so that's okay but it's that um that triggering from hearing about it, not just living through it, that needs to be addressed so these kids aren't wearing this for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I mean, I've got, sorry, I've got three little boys and I, so we're still in the primary school, so I can't answer for secondary school, but they're doing the resilience project at school. And I have to say, I don't want to start a conversation about curriculums, but it is probably one of the best parts about them at school because they learn the life skills as to how to get through situations and kind of adapt as opposed to the process of learning which I know they need to do um, but I think there's a wonderful opportunity there to really build um, our youth and particularly again in Melbourne I can't tell you how many um, instances of kids that were really impacted by the two years of closures particularly boys at that kind of year nine level who lost their whole social connection they went from hanging out with their mates to going to nothing, um, really, really impacting uh, mental and, and, and physical well-being. So I think there's a big need um, for broader programs, yep. but a bit outside my scope. Yep, understand. And I don't claim to be an expert in education and disaster resilience, but for any of the um, people attending today who who supported that question and wanted to have that chat. Uh, there is some information on the ADA website. We have done some mapping about uh, the curriculum in schools and how and where disaster resilience and risk reduction can be applied to the curriculum. And we've even been part of a project to develop some lesson plans 
and we worked uh, through our partners with a number of schools about building it in. And there are some particular schools post Black Saturday here in Victoria uh, that have done some great work with their upper primary uh, kids. And the kids are really, really clear. Some of them presented at one of our conferences. They're very clear, they spoke for themselves that learning about it reduced their anxiety, did not increase their anxiety. And their brave parents and brave teachers who decided that more information might be helpful mm. were proven quite correct. As the kids said, I used to be anxious and now I'm not. I understand where I live and what to do. Anyway, so feel free to um, attack our website and find that material. There's quite a lot uh, available on it. Margaret, Another can I just comment too? Sorry, I see Sabrina's just posted about Girls on Fire project and that's going yep. to Kangaroo Island, which is a fantastic news. I think that's such a great initiative, exactly like what you've said about showing what happens, how to do, you know, how to respond to it, what role you can play. I think programs like that are really, really wonderful for that teenage audience. So I'm going to flip to a very tactical question. Uh, this question starts with quite a tactical question, but is there a platform or an app of choice for business people, groups to connect with each other online? Now, I don't think that's a Facebook question, but um, is there a business app? Is there any, any kind of platform you guys would like to plug? No, I mean, from my perspective, yeah, LinkedIn, obviously, for professionals, um, Facebook and Instagram um, as well for local communities. But um, I don't think, I think I've heard of a few communities that have their own sort of um, set up connection. Um, we did a project with a bushfire impacted community a number of years ago. And rather than using necessarily an app, we just had like the mobile phone became the connector. So they shared everyone's phone numbers and you know, those who are not socially um, active just literally had people's numbers. But um, Fiona, what do you use in KI? <laughs> <laughs> I would rather talk to somebody and have the discussion rather than just keyboard warrior. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you add really quickly? I mean, I think my suggestion would be do not go to brand new crazy technology here um, between WhatsApp and texting and group, and group communication already. Again, we don't want to put more burden on people, right? It needs to be natural everyday activities that we can do. It shouldn't have to be that I think to myself, okay, log into that crazy app with four different passwords and then activate my location. No, it should be, okay, I'm, I'm on a WhatsApp already with my friends and family. Oh, this is my local business's WhatsApp where I'm already, you know, doing that work with micro lessons, right, with Renee's program. Okay, and here's like what I connect. We don't want to have to build something crazy because again, we don't want to add, this shouldn't be a burden, right, to be able to build our connections. And I don't know about anybody else, but I live in Ballarat. It's a regional town, Daniel. Um, and on Facebook, there are all sorts of local groups. So there's a local repair cafe and I can go and meet people and repair something that needs a repair and I don't know how to do it. There are so many local community groups that get together at different times, lots of different ways of connecting based on your interest. Um, I'm very conscious we're getting very close to running out of time. There's one uh, remaining question that's got a lot of upticks. So let me just give this a whirl and see if you've got any views. It's a question about how important is it to have a common narrative about resilience? And I have to, uh, Marcella, I too have struck this. Uh, you talk about resilience and people nod and you don't discover until later that they don't mean what you mean. Uh, or you talk about resilience and then you explain what you mean and somebody does, frowns because that's not what they think resilience is. So how important is it to have this common narrative about resilience and to have it both inside your organization, perhaps more broadly, uh, because everyone's, we can no longer assume we all agree with each other, I think is where we're at. I mean, look, the academic community will never agree on anything, right? There's 34 <laughs> professors and a thousand opinions. I think the easiest definition of resilience is transformation. Does this power that you have, the connections that you have, does it give you the ability to change your community in response to what's coming in the future? Not just recovering, not rebuilding back what you had already, but not building back as was, but transformational ability. And I think that gets us beyond like, is resilience, is it, is it about rubber? Is it about bouncing? Is it about buildings? No, no. Some of the things is, is does the community have the ability as a group, right, to make decisions and to think and collectively work as a group that will make them better prepared for the future? And I think, too, um, as someone who uh, rebranded their business to Resilient Ready in the um, scope of a lot of people going, 
oh my gosh, not that R word again. Um, it was really when Daniel first arrived um, on his Fulbright a couple of months ago that we had the conversation around resilience and what does it mean? And we're in the Blue Mountains and we had a, we had a few people crying and all sorts of things because for whatever reasons. But I think the premise is we're all, we all have resilience in us, right? We're all going to adapt to a situation. It's just how we're able to do that. And resilient ready and, and what we're focusing on, and I guess a lot of the work that Daniel's about too, it is that transforming, but transforming before. So transform before so that you are ready and you have the uh, networks and the processes and the systems set up so that you're thriving in the good times so that when the next and the next and the next and the next bad time comes, whatever that is, because it's coming, you know, cyber, it's coming all places at the moment, you know how to respond and you're pretty much set up so that it's only going to be perhaps a slight bump in the road as opposed to a major catastrophic disruption for your business or your home or your livelihood. So I think that transformation and that transform word to get ready is absolutely key to the resilience conversation. And resilience comes from within. Everyone's different and everyone will tackle things at different times. Um, so it's a very broad broad word. Each, it's not a little word. It's a very broad word. And everyone's ready to be resilient at different times. Yep. So I wish we happen. had... I wish we had much more time because there's a, there are a few questions we didn't get to and there's so much we could talk about. Um, I'm very pleased to have given you the final word, Fiona. So um, it's good that we ended on you. One of the remaining questions does say, thank you, Fiona, and then asks the <laughs> question. So uh, <laughs> Renee and Daniel, you're very important, but Fiona, Fiona, <laughs> thank you in particular to you. Um, look, I would like to just round us out uh, and thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm keen to acknowledge that this week is National Volunteering Week in Australia and the volunteers um, who may be online, I thank you for whatever contribution you all make to the communities where you live. Um, we really do rely a lot on our volunteers in a lot of sectors, in aged care, in education, and in our work in disaster resilience. So um, I do thank any volunteer present for the work that you do. Um, it's all we have time for, unfortunately, today. So I would like to thank Daniel, Renee and Fiona for taking the time today. On behalf of Ada, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, you will all receive... Don't know why I hopped offline. Um, you will all receive um, a recording of today's session and we will put it on um, the Knowledge Hub, the Ada Knowledge Hub, so you'll be able to link... Uh, to that and, and listen to this and or share it with your friends and colleagues and your business associates. So um, as you exit today, there will be um, a survey that you'll be asked to complete. We do really sincerely ask you to complete that. We take it very seriously. We have a look at it. We try to adopt any suggestions or feedback in future um, events so that we continue to meet your needs. So please share your thoughts with us. It's been a pleasure to host everybody this afternoon. And I thank you for attending. Until we see you again next time, stay safe and farewell. <laughs>